is Facundo, we are in Dialogos. This time we are with Neil Kinnock. Neil Kinnock's most notable role was at the leader of the Labour Party. He served as Member of Parliament from 1970 to, nine, to 1995. He was Vice President of the U European Commission from 1999 to, to 2004, and he was elevated to the House of Lords as Baron Kinnock in 2005, and he is still a prominent figure in British politics. So, hello Neil, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. Good okay. to see you. But nobody's given me any shock therapy. So I'm bound to be a little bit better than most people in uh, Argentina. <laughs> I, 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 clearly, I clearly understand that Ar Argentina is having a very, very di difficult time. And I guess that uh, any, anything that happened in the Labour Party in the so-called wilder wilderness, wilderness years was better than what, what is happening in Argentina right now. Even though, in some ways, of course, uh, we were subjected to a similar body of uh, policy. I mean, I'm, I'm not expert in Argentine politics, and I'm not going to go into it now, but it, it does seem to me that the current new regime is seeking to follow uh, some of the philosophy and applied politics of Mrs. Thatcher. And I do not recommend that because uh, our country, all these years later, is suffering the legacy in terms of housing, economic performance, productivity, output, international trade, all kinds of problems. So I hope that they are not in store for your country. Well, I, actually, that was one of the questions that I was going to ask. So I, I'm I, I'm not going I'm not going to the Thatcher's legacy right now. What what I wanted to to do as a start is is with something nicer. Is your relationship with Michael Foot, and how was that? It was something like a mentorship and respect. I know it was like a transition in the in the part in the party's direction, but 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 how. Can you think about uh, Michael Foote now in 2024? He was a lovely man, a great individual with marvelous integrity and lots of courage. But he was also a great creator because he was recognized even by enemies as a supreme writer, as a journalist and as a biographer uh, and as a reviewer. And, of course, on his feet, he was amongst the most brilliant speakers of his generation. So he had great accomplishments, but it was his comradeship that I always cherished. Um, I've never had a mentor, and he certainly wouldn't <laughs> regard himself to be any kind of a tutor or mentor or avuncular figure. And we had our differences. We had uh, very uh, <laughs> strident quarrels. Um, I could go into some of the detail of that. But um, whatever policy differences we had, um, we never had a flaw in our friendship, um, largely because he was such a, a generous and considerate individual who profoundly believed in freedom of expression. And the last thing that he would have ever wanted to do is to try to con curtail my freedom of expression. And I certainly um, always supported his freedom of expression. So um, he, he was a dear, dear, dear friend and a man of great capacity uh, who was dealt a very tragic hand in many ways. I um, sought to persuade him, without any resistance really, not to run for the leadership of the Labour Party, because I knew it would be purgatory. Uh, but uh, others prevailed on him, uh, including his dear wife, Jill, who was, I also loved very much. Um, and uh, he 
decided it was his duty to run, and he did run, uh, and he won. Um, and then the purgatory arrived, uh, largely because uh, some of those who had urged him to run immediately started to treat him as if he was some kind of right-wing alien instead of a man who was trying to modernize and change the Labour Party and its policies so that the respect and support of the electorate could be regained. Uh, so he endured that for about three years. And um, the results, of course, were catastrophic in electoral terms. But what he did was enable the Labour Party to continue to exist. And that meant that when I succeeded him, uh, I had to uh, finish the job, really, um, in some ways dramatically, uh, in other ways gradually, but over the years profoundly. And I'm quite proud of that. But if he hadn't sustained the existence of the Labour Party as a political force, nothing could have been done. So you say that uh, if if that if um, Michael Foot wouldn't be uh, well if if he in other aspect wouldn't have been elected, um, the Social Democrats uh, or the Gang of of, of Four would uh, in in other aspect will have um, achieved their objective of finish with the Labour Party. That's right. Um... I don't know how much your listeners uh, know about the uh, intimate detail of British politics in the 1980s, but uh, a group split off from the Labour Party and formed the Social Democratic Party, the SDP, under the leadership of very distinguished, uh, indeed a, a man I respected, uh, Roy Jenkins. And... Uh, altogether about uh, 28, I think, Labour MPs left the party and joined the Social Democrats. Some of them very able people, some of them complete duds who were in danger of being deselected from their seats. But the SDP attracted a great deal of support uh, because, as my wife, in fact, gave the definition, Uh, they were Labour without the trade unions and with the nuclear bomb. And uh, consequently, for about a year, they rode very high in the polls. They won by-elections and they were a real threat to the Labour Party. So much so that by 1987, one of my main functions in leading my party into the general election was to try to ensure that we retained, at very least, retained second place. And we did manage to uh, push the Social Democrats, by then allied with the Liberal Party, into third place. And within two years, we completely finished them off uh, by devastatingly defeating them in by-elections, local council elections, and so on. But until 1987, they were a real threat. Now, Michael did everything he could to negotiate with the people who were going to defect to the Social Democrats. He did it with patience, he did it with courtesy, he did it with intellectual strength, and he did persuade some not to go. But others were completely lost, and he therefore had to face uh, opponents on two fronts, not just the Tories in government, but the Social Democrats in opposition. And he did it with immense courage and a great deal of fortitude, um, which really managed to sustain Labour as a pro party that genuinely could claim to be on the left, but appealing to the center of British politics as well. And uh, 
he deserves great, great respect for that. Well, actually, I, I, I was thinking that uh, I, I, I failed to see the point in, in uh, if, if I am comparing your leadership with the STP because you were saying that it was like the labor without the, um, without the unions and without the, the nuclear bomb, and that is what actually. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Time, labor was in favor of the Labour Party policy was to favor unilateral nuclear disarmament, which was a policy, amongst several others, that I had to get changed. Uh, that took me six years, five to six years, because, of course, with issues like armaments and defense, you don't just get people adopting political positions. They become almost religious in their zeal. And so you've got to not just shift their votes, but move their deeply held beliefs. So it took quite a lot of time, but we managed to do that. The same thing applied in some other areas, like our relationship with the European Union and so on. Uh, so that was an uphill struggle. But um, one of the appeals, as you identified, of the uh, Social Democratic Party was that they weren't associated with the trade unions that electorally were very unpopular, wrongly in my view, but I understand why, uh, and that they were in favor of retaining uh, the nuclear deterrent. Yes, but what what I was saying is that if, if like, a purgatory... Uh, happened um in the labor party um I, i think that what you're saying is that it was better to do the purgatory within the labor party and not outside of it not in a war with the social democrats like it was better to do it yes. inside the labor party that's right in a first past the post system as you understand parties that divide into factions are always weakened But if they formalize that division into splitting off and forming a separate party, uh, they further diminish um, the possibility of overthrowing the establishment party. And of course, uh, that was borne out by the result of the 1983 and indeed the 1987 election and come to that to a degree, the 1992 election. Um, I can give you the figures. In uh, 1983, um, Labour got just under 30% of the vote, and the Social Democrats and Liberals uh, got um, about 26% of the vote. So between the two parties in 83, they got well in excess of 50%. And Mrs. Thatcher was then elected in a party that hadn't divided uh, with 43% of the vote, getting, of course, a massive majority of over 140 in the House of Commons and 100% of the power, which she used 150%. Um, so so um, every body in a first-past-the-post democracy understands the danger, in my view, the great foolishness of dividing parties. And it massively profited the Conservative Party, of course. But also in, for example, in 19, 1985, in your, well, your Labour speech conference, when you... Um, criticizes uh, the, the leadership of the Liverpool City Council for their extreme policies and actions. And when you uh, took a firm, a, a, a stern firm against the militant tendency, actually the, the Trotsky faction, um, isn't that like modernizing the Labour Party in a sense that, okay, so we have to, to work in an agenda that is uh, not Thatcher, but it's like the, what the world is dictating. We cannot go with the old left. 
That's right. But they weren't really the old left, you see. As you say, they were a Trotskyite faction, an interest faction, um, all over the world, including, I think, probably in Argentina, people are familiar with ultra-leftists um, who profoundly believe, wrongly, of course, but nevertheless, some of them sincerely, that uh, conditions have to become immensely bleak and damaging before the working class will develop consciousness and rise up against the cause of their oppression, exploitation, and disadvantage. And of course, in my view, that's always been fantasy and has been shown to be fantasy time and time again. But this idea of what's called revolutionary pessimism does take hold amongst some people, otherwise quite intelligent people, because it's got a certain romantic and absolutist appeal. And people who adopt dogma, uh, who come close to bigotry in their politics, only have to make up their mind once in their lives, generally speaking, when they're quite young. And then, of course, they measure all developments, all events, indeed all other people, by whether they are conforming to that dogma. And of course, that is ridiculous. You can't, you can't bring up kids or drive a car or make a cup of tea on that basis. Um, but nevertheless, there are people uh, who consider that. They also think that the advance of socialism has to be total and complete in order to be satisfactory. And of course, that's rubbish as well, because as my great political hero, and that, her, that attitude is shared by many other people, and Irene Bevan, democratic socialist, made very clear that the advance, the victory of socialism doesn't have to be complete in order to be very substantial. Uh, but those who are looking for perfection are obviously or often the enemies of uh, gradual and tolerable and irreversible advance. And they, they can, from time to time, if they're quite well organized, really get in the way. So in attacking the militant tendency, and their interest tactics, I not only had to defeat them constitutionally, which was an arduous business inside the Labour Party constitution, which is understandably and rightly a very generous, broad constitution, very tolerant of diverse beliefs and convictions. That's right, that's how it should be. But these people were abusing the privileges given to them as members of the Labour Party. And so I had to deal with them constitutionally. But more specifically, I had to persuade large parts of the Labour Party that in order to secure the votes of a broad spectrum of the public, there were tactics and antics that simply could not be tolerated because they alienated normal, well-disposed people, as they did. And that if we were really going to get an opportunity to put our ideals into practice, to make our principles the law of the land, uh, we were going to have to take the people with us instead of uh, accepting the delusion uh, that the day would come when the public will be full of revolutionary fervor. Anyway, uh, over the years, I managed to do that. And yeah, I... so by, by 1992, the party was electable, but it was Tony Blair that got us elected five years after that. Yes, but uh, I, what I was thinking, actually, is that um, Tony Blair and Keir Starmer are in a way, like Kinnock's 
wing of the party and the loony left still has like a wing and that is Jeremy Corbyn. I don't know if, if you think in that way. Um, yes, the, the thing is the Corbynite attitude, which I just broadly described, uh, well-intentioned, but detached from the realities with which most people live. Um, and uh, antagonistic to codes of behavior, uh, attitudes, conventions that people accept, harmless conventions, really, uh, that's just part of the warp and weft of normal life. Um, that Corbynite attitude um, uh, always has existed, always will exist, in probably every socialist movement. Um, and it's largely composed of people, not Trotsky militant uh, interests, but decent sane people who want and insist upon uh, dramatic declarations in the belief that it will secure dramatic progressive advance. And, um, that's, that's not the real world. Like but, an anti-market. Anti I, I anti quarrel with their sincerity. I quarrel with their common sense. Um, which, of course, uh, if you abandon that in democratic politics, you truly are lost. Common sense is pretty rare, but it's absolutely vital. Yeah. Do you know what when I, when I was well I'm a, a big fan of British politics so I'm I'm going into a very uh, detail here but one of the tactics that uh, you used uh, was being well one was uh, the rose like uh, entering the rose in the Labour Party as as, as a symbol and the other one was uh, to be more appealing uh, to the media I, I I don't know how you took uh, uh, caricatures like spitting image or shows like that? Uh, well, it goes with the territory. And uh, spitting image was, in terms of its productions, generally fairly favorable to me. I mean, they, uh, they made mock and uh, they were satirical and so on. But in a democracy, if you can't take that, um, you should go and live elsewhere. Um, I, the only damaging bit of it, and uh, when I've spoken to the people who made the programs in later years, they've all uh, been quite apologetic, really. They used, for the years that they were broadcasting, every Sunday night, an opening title, which showed me falling on the beach in Brighton on the day I was elected leader of the Labour Party. And, I mean, the, the tale behind that is quite amusing. My wife, my darling wife, <laughs> had new grey suede boots. And they were beautiful boots. And she looked very smart in them. And at the suggestion of the photographers, we went for a stroll along the beach uh, uh, in Brighton. Uh, with the sea on our left and Brighton town on the right. And the beach in Brighton is shingle. And the tide was coming in. And when the water threatened to get near to the beautiful grey suede boots, my wife leapt out of the way. Unnecessarily, the water wasn't actually lapping over her boots. It missed her by about half a meter, but in doing that, she bumped into me and I lost my footing, which I instantly regained, rather heroically, <laughs> and then gave um, a decent sign to the cameras, and we laughed at it, and that incident passed off. But of course, when it was shown every Sunday night for years, it gave the impression of a complete clown. And um, the people who made the program didn't recognize that. Uh, I knew it was the case. 
the worst thing was my children had to go to the local comprehensive school every Monday. And of all of the problems they encountered, which I guess included various kinds of physical threats and so on, uh, and on a few occasions meant that we had to ensure a police guard that they knew and never knew about. They never knew about it. Um, following them to school. But, I mean, that was incidental. It was largely because of the emergency in Northern Ireland and the provisional IRA and the armed so-called loyalists. But um, they had to endure the mockery of their school fellows from uh, my son was aged 13, my daughter was aged 11. So they, I mean, they said it was very character forming, but it was bloody awful for them. They never, ever told us, not until years and years and years later, when they were fully grown adults and graduated from university and so on. Then they told us. <laughs> so that was, that was the only damage. But in terms of presentation, uh, I adopted uh, the rose as the symbol for labor, red rose. Um, I got the design from one of my father-in-law's rose catalogs. He was a lovely gardener and grew roses. Uh, and I got a design adapted from that. And uh, the uh, conventional, traditional element in the Labour Party on the National Executive Committee would have resisted it because it was change. You couldn't have good God, a Socialist Party with change. Good God, he couldn't have that. <laughs> so I didn't even tell them. We just launched it. And of course, there was hell to pay, but I quite enjoyed that fight. Um, and as far as the press was concerned, the media, um, most of the press in uh, Great Britain, in the United Kingdom, is very, very firmly associated with the right wing and the Conservative Party. Um, so I knew that if we were going to make any appeal at all, it had to be through TV and broadcasting. So I tended to concentrate on that. And um, on that, we fought the Conservatives at least to a draw. Uh, and while they were spending millions, we, all, we had very little money to spend. But because of the talent that we could recruit, Oscar winners and people of huge um, reputation in the cinemas and in the theater, um, we did pretty well. We frightened them to death, I have to tell you that, um, the Tories. But uh, in the end, they still squeaked home. And, and, and how did you deal with uh, the, the ideas of nationalization and the relationship with trade unions, with the old relationships with trade unions? Yes. Well, trade unions are fundamental to the British Labour movement. I've been a trade unionist since I was 16. Uh, I still belong to the same union. Um, and uh, trade unions have been one of the vital elements in advancing the condition of uh, my family over the last three generations, uh, and they still are. Uh, indeed, in some ways, in this age of automation and uh, artificial intelligence and climate challenge, uh, trade unions, organizations of workers are probably as important as they've ever been. But, um, Thatcher introduced a variety of uh, laws, some of which were draconian, stupid, ideological offenses against organized labor uh, and contradicted human rights, in my view. Others were just sensible provisions in a democracy for voting 
uh, in the secret ballot for uh, union leaderships, for strike action and so on. So what I had to do was to uh, persuade the trade union movement not to issue a blanket, unconditional condemnation of everything Thatcher had done, but to be selective in its demands for change. And uh, eventually we all agreed upon a program. And uh, by 1989, 1990, had decided on a formula which recommended itself to the trade union movement and the Labour Party, and ultimately recommended itself to the general public, because it's what um, Tony Blair was elected on in 1997 with a massive majority, and he proceeded to make the decent reforms. So uh, that was uh, essential um, because uh, the conduct of trade unions or trade unionists at various times uh, in the 1960s, 70s, 80s had really uh, breached trust in the general public. Um, and it wasn't so much the actions they took, people are entitled to go on strike and that's almost universally accepted in the British electorate, but some of the leaderships that struck demagogic postures and was seen on television as being a threat to normality and stability. Some of them would have liked to have been, others were misrepresented. Um, so we had to clear that out of the way before we could get people to hear our sane arguments on economics, the conduct of industrial relations, uh, the safeguarding of civil rights and so on and so forth. Anyway, we eventually achieved that. Uh, and Tony Tony Blair made the necessary changes, um, which are still pretty much in place, even though in recent years, in desperation and looking for enemies to defeat, the current Conservative government um, has made further changes, which are not conducive to good industrial relations or indeed to civil rights. Oh, uh, okay. So, um, uh, one of the uh, uh, things that uh, was uh, essential for your uh, career in La Labour Party was your response to the 1984-85 minor strike. So, um, it was kind of controversial within the party because uh, you were really cr criticized. So. How would you reflect that, uh, well, the, those years, uh, you, you know, that many years ago? Um, I, I'll take you back to a few months before the strike. In uh, late 1983, uh, two things occurred. One, I had a meeting with Arthur Scargill, the president of the National Union of Mine Workers, who had never been a friend, uh, but nevertheless was the leader of a major trade union, one that my father, my uncles, my grandfathers had both belonged to and was very substantial in my constituency where I had over 4,000 workers in the coal mining industry. So naturally I was um, sympathetic to the miners case for preventing uh, unnecessary uh, closure of collieries, knowing, as everybody did, that coal mining is an extractive industry and eventually in every colliery, exhaustion uh, or increasing danger makes the pit unworkable. Everybody knows that. So um, in that meeting with Scargill, uh, we agreed that it would be good if during the forthcoming work to rule in the industry, uh, miners who were taking time out should go around the country to the non-coal mining areas in order to pamphlet and explain and hold meetings 
uh, demonstrating how vital coal was to the operation of normal life, uh, both in terms of industrial production and in terms of civilized existence in homes and schools and hospitals and shops. And he thought that was a good idea. And uh, indeed, when the work to rule started in November, uh, some of the coal fields, including my own in South Wales, undertook that kind of public information exercise. In the uh, early March of 1984, however, the National Coal Board appeared to announce the closure of a colliery that was on the safe list, a Court and Wood colliery in Yorkshire. And the miners in Court and Wood pretty naturally responded by walking out of work. And the word spread that, uh, the, any, that the National Coal Board uh, had a hit list which included collieries that had been previously deemed to be eco economically and geological, geologically sound and safe. Um, and that spread. Uh, I fully anticipated and naturally spoke to Scargill and to the leaders of the industry in South Wales, who were my friends and very good comrades, um, and said it would be essential uh, if there was to be a national strike that the rules of the National in the Mine Workers were followed and there was a national ballot, a pithead ballot, uh, to decide democratically on the course of action. That's exactly what the uh, article in the Miners' Constitution had, uh, had set down. Um, Scargill ignored that, and uh, at the Easter of twenty of nineteen eighty four, um, which was an early Easter, uh, had an extraordinary special conference at which it was decided that the uh, strike would go ahead, that there would be no uh, national ballot, and that they would call upon other unions for solidarity. Now, I knew very well, and I think Scargill knew very well, really, that the chances of the strike being really successful in terms of neutralizing at least the NCB um, approach was going to be extremely difficult, given that without a ballot, there was no democratic mandate for the mining workforce and secondly, that no other trade unionists would feel an obligation to take sympathetic action, which, of course, with coal is particularly vital uh, because it, it only becomes really effective if you can stop the movements of coal within the country, mainly by rail, and the importation of coal. But other trade unionists felt well, if the miners haven't had a ballot, um, there's no reason for me to give up my wages in order to support them, even though there was widespread sympathy. So I was worried about the conduct of the strike from the beginning. And it guaranteed, of course, that without a ballot, there would be a divided workforce, which was pretty lethal. And it did transpire like that. The Nottinghamshire Coalfield, with several prosperous working collieries, did not come out on strike. And there were other collieries in Leicestershire, Lancashire, and a few other places that didn't come out either. The result was that Scargill adopted a strategy of mass picketing in order to prevent people going to work. In some cases, that was successful, but not many, because when you challenge working people by saying that we're going to stop you going into work, uh, the reaction to that is obvious and I think pretty natural. So it meant that there had to be a big 
police presence at collieries and power stations and ports. Now, while all this was going on, uh, long before it, since 1981 indeed, Mrs. Thatcher had made preparations to combat a mining strike. In 1981, uh, without making preparations, she conceded to a substantial mining wage increase. And she was very resentful about that and remembered also the memory of 1974 when uh, the then Prime Minister, Ted Heath, conducted a general election on the basis of who governs Britain in order to try and rally electoral support against a minor strike where mass picketing featured substantially. So Scargill thought he could repeat that experience. Mrs. Thatcher was determined to resist it. So she had, without making any public announcements, she changed several laws in order to deprive striking workers' families of any form of benefit. She'd organized a national policing system which was completely unknown in the United Kingdom. We've never had any kind of national police force or coordinating system. We've got about 40 separate police forces. And she'd secured the appointment of an American businessman to the chairmanship of the National Coal Board, a man named McGregor. And she'd also ensured the largest ever stockpile of coal at collieries, power stations, docks, and anywhere that could accommodate great piles of, uh, of coal. So that by March of 1984, the stockpile of coal in Britain was about 40% higher than it had ever been in any comparable period previously. So she had readied for the strike. She was very happy that they went on strike, but the bonus she got was, of course, the absence of a ballot. She hadn't anticipated that. She thought they would have a ballot and then go on strike. And with the consequence of a divided workforce. So it meant that she literally could divide and rule, organize the police, nationally and rely upon uh, Scargill's demographic or sorry, demagogic um, conduct to alienate public support, which it did. So the strike dragged on for a whole year. Politically, of course, it was very damaging to us because of the Labour Party and my specific close association with the miners. Uh, I never uh, stood back from that in any shape or form. But in my frequent contact with coal miners and coal mining trade union lodges, especially in my own area, uh, I told people that without a ballot, the strike was doomed. But I couldn't afford to say that publicly because I wasn't going to demoralize the miners and their families, the communities, by uh, appearing to uh, be against what they were doing uh, and not to understand the cause that they were fighting for, to which I and the Labour Party generally, and indeed many other people, were sympathetic because we understood the absolute significance of coal and had a very civilised and economical uh, productive plan for coal, which we insisted on keeping uh, sustaining presentation to the public. But of course, the strike wore on twice in the strike in July 84 and September 84. Uh, we had managed to establish a formula which secured the agreement of the National Coal Board leadership. And when we took it to Scargill, uh, he completely dismissed it and insisted that uh, mass picketing 
would uh, do the job. But of course, it never could in a free society uh, with people able to make up their own minds and with devastating poverty, devastating poverty inflicted on the coal mining communities. It was pitiful. Then uh, eventually we knew the miners would be starved back to work. Um, I mean, I helped uh, without publicity to raise quite a lot of money to send to the coal mining areas uh, in order to make provision for families, especially for the children. And in my area, that was brilliantly operated by a group of Labour Party women who were superhuman. So it was an appalling experience, damaging politically to us, um, undermining uh, our ability to earn the trust of the general public. And the resentments lasted. And of course, the damage to the coal mining communities was irreparable. Uh, in the wake of the strike, uh, a year after the strike, uh, the coal mining employment in my constituency had gone down from over 4,000 uh, to about 2,000. And the last colliery closed in 1989, despite the fact that there were large deposits of highly valuable coal uh, left in the ground because the new leadership of uh, the coal industry simply wouldn't invest uh, about five million pounds to exploit the deposits, which were at that stage worth well in excess of 50 million pounds. So that was the result. And in those communities, uh, family breakup, economic disaster, unemployment, drug taking, um, social misconduct, tension. Uh, in some cases, that still, all these years later, decades later, afflicts those parts of the country. And so the consequence of the strike was in every respect utterly appalling. People kept their pride, and I always respected and applauded them for that, and they knew it. But you can't live on pride, and you certainly can't live on revolutionary rhetoric. Um, I said to Scargill in the wake of the strike, uh, I was invited to the Scottish Miners Gala uh, by Mick McGachley, who was a dear, dear friend and comrade, who was leader of the Scottish Miners. Um, so I went to the gala, and people were expecting all kinds of trouble uh, because of the stance I'd taken during the strike in calling for a ballot. I didn't call in my view as frequently or as loudly as I could and should have. That's always been a regret, but everybody knew where I stood, that without the, the ballot, the strike was doomed, uh, and it was hell on earth. Uh, but I went to the gala. I got nothing but a friendly reception from the miners. And I said to Scargill, who was also a speaker at the uh, at the big demonstration, uh, that he was unique in the history of trade unions. He'd started a strike with a small house and a big union, and he ended the strike with a small union and a big house. That was the last words we ever exchanged. And do you consider yourself and just by uh, ending this because of the Zoom meeting and because I, we have like this li limited time, but uh, this is a great talk. Do you consider yourself as the modernizer of the Labour Party? And one more thing is that um, what is your definition of socialism? Because I remember that Tony Blair said that socialism was uh, every person having its own car, having uh, a job and like individual development. So how 
will be your definition of socialism? Well, it's certainly about individual development. And my view is that uh, all of the activities that we undertake uh, collectively should have as their function, their central aim, individual emancipation. Uh, so democratic socialism is a creed for uh, free uh, individualism. Uh, but if you want a definition, my view is that all major economic and political decisions should be taken in ways that are consistent with well-being of human society and have to be accountable in order to ensure that that can take place. That's why it's democratic socialism. Uh, and uh, if to Tony's definition, I don't think he'd ever thought a lot about it because he's not in any sense ideological, uh, neither am I, certainly not dogmatic. Um, by definition, socialists have to be pragmatic because the world and its realities change. But you have a central body of principles of liberty, solidarity, that mean that you really have to consider your neighbor to be your brother. And in my case, I believe, as do most socialists, uh, that uh, my neighbor is right across the world. And that's even more true now than it's ever been because of the complete interdependence of humanity. Nothing can happen without having an effect uh, at every distance and any distance. And if nothing else proves that, our response to the climate crisis does. But that's not the only sphere in which that understanding of the condition of others and the comprehension that it is a common condition to all of us is absolutely vital. So uh, that's, that's my socialism. As far as modernizing the party is concerned, yes, I, uh, my efforts were to bring it and its uh, policies and philosophy and presentation up to date. But I always thought of it really in terms of restoring the Labour Party as a trustworthy uh, vehicle for the aspirations of normal people and uh, more generally enlightenment and emancipation. So uh, it, was, it was to reinstall those values as central tenets of the Labour Party. Now, of course, a lot of people in the party and the Labour movement generally already believed that. But some of those people hadn't crystallized it, thought about it, and weren't asserting it with the confidence that they should. Uh, I think by 1992, we'd restored their confidence. So they were very happy to be democratic socialists and not in any sense cowed either by conservatism or by the ultra left, but as people of independent minds and decent commitment. Well, with, with those, uh, uh, I would say, um, triumphant words, uh, I will close the dialogue by asking you to recommend a film, a book, and a song for the listeners in Spotify. Uh, a film, a book, and what else? And a song. All right. Um, well, the song would have to be, well, you can make a choice. We Shall Overcome, or uh, Sunny Day by Simon and Garfunkel. Oh, th that's great. Uh, That's right. Um, the, the film would either have to be Grapes of Wrath 
um, produced and directed by John Ford uh, in the early 1940s, or Singing in the Rain with Gene Kelly. And the book, um, the book, uh, God damn, there's so much choice. Jenkins, um, Jenkins on Churchill. <laughs> Uh, that was that was good. It appeared in the same year as um, Martin Westlake's biography of me. And the general consensus was that had it not been Jenkins, a man of great distinction, on Churchill, a man of great fame, then uh, Martin's book would have won biography of the year because it was his damn fine book. Um, now, what book? Uh, I think either, well, I tell you what, if you want to be really bleak, um, Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian, which is really the story, and it is a bleak and bloody story of uh, um, of uh, a, a gang of uh, men in the southwest of the USA who were mercenaries earning money by the slaughter of Indians. But basically, behind that, it's a story of how empires were made, are made. Um, and that's very bleak. So uh, I'd also recommend Good Expectations by Charles Dickens because the great story and I like happy endings. I love happy endings. Um, uh, or there's, uh, there's a relatively recent book, two years ago, I think, um, How to Be a Liberal um, by a, a man called Ian Dent. Um, and I recommend that for anybody who wants to be reassured about why they believe what they believe in the most rational and historically accurate way. It's worth reading that. Well, Neil, this was a great talk. Thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed it. And in 2024, we have general elections on Britain. So uh, maybe we will have you again on the show. Maybe. Okay, give us a shout. Uh, <laughs> we've also got the general election in the USA, of course, and I'm terrified at the possibility that Trump could win. He's yes. a real bloody stain on humanity. Yes, I think that we are on the same vein, uh, but here, Starmer, I think he's going to win on the well, general we election. It. We can do it. <laughs> so, Neil, thank you so much for, for your time. My name is Facundo Guadagno, and this was another episode of Dialogos.